There you go. All right, Carl. All right. Welcome to the 2020 Pacifica presidential debate. Um, we are excited to bring this to you. If things go well, we may do this again before um, before the election. So good morning. Thank you for joining us. We are 31 short days away from election day. Things are intensifying and everything is under scrutiny more so than ever before. As we all know, President Trump is at the Walter Reed Medical Center after being diagnosed on Thursday afternoon with COVID-19. We at Poly by Design wish the president and the first lady um, and all those afflicted with COVID-19 a speedy and full recovery. The opinions today expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of Poly by Design as a 501c3 organization or its employees. There's your disclaimer. Hey, yeah. Naki Moli is the co-founder of Poly by Design and the FICA broadcast. Welcome, Naki. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, Carl is also the co-founder of Poly by Design and the FICA podcast. We are not um, we are podcast hosts, not professional moderators uh, or political analysts. So we're going to do our very best this morning. So bear with us. Um, we're just trying to give a platform to Pacific Islanders that are passionate about their political beliefs. And on that note, let's meet the panelists. First, we have Robin Kia Noma Ayab currently serves as the Chief Executive Officer of Zephyr Partner Solutions. She grew up in Southern California in the city of Carson. Robin is Samoan Afatasi. Her dad's side is from Hawaii by way of Falelatai, Samoa, while her mom is from Michigan by way of Eastern Europe. Oh, thank you. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Um, Rob, uh, Robin is happily married to her husband for 29 years and they have five sons and one daughter and they currently reside in the state of Nevada. Welcome, Robin. Thank you, Naki. Thank you, Carl. I really appreciate the opportunity to come on and uh, collaborate and share and talk with uh, my fellow brothers and sisters of the Pacifica Islands. Thank you so much. My pleasure, uh, honor. The next um, team, Biden Harris, is Dela Tayali Higgs. I don't want to mess up. I'm jacking that up. Is a Samoan Tongan American born and raised in Salt Lake City, Utah. She currently serves as the sales operation manager for Select Health. Additionally, Dela serves as a trustee on the following boards, Spy Hop Productions, Mana Academy Charter School, 90.9 FM KRCL, Moana Nui, Utah, and The Road Home. She also volunteers heavily in her community and is a member of a few local organizations. Some work consists of the Utah Pacific Islander Health Coalition, Utah Women's Forum, Bev Weepy for Mill Creek City Council District 4, and the Tuila Women's Circle. Dela attended Chapman University before raising a family of three with her college sweetheart of 28 years. Welcome, Dela. Thank you, Naki, and thank you so much, Carl, Fafatai, Lava. Excited to engage in such an important discussion. Civic engagement obviously is becoming something that we are all recognized we get to participate in. So I'm really appreciative to uh, be a part of this group and have just a really good dialogue. So where you have already stated uh, with some disclaimers that you're not political pundits or uh, this is not a political show, I will say too, I'm not a professional debater, but I'm happy to participate in the discussion. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to introduce Team Trump. Um, Sydney C.C. Liu Fao is a full-time Clark County, Nevada employee. Sid currently serves on two community boards as a Polynesian community organizer, serving on the Nevada American Asian Pacific Islanders Committee and on the Asian Pacific Committee Awareness Committee. Sid's unique 20 year worldwide professional film and television interaction as a director, actor, stuntman in over 30 movies and television projects. Blessed to have traveled to 25 various countries and has taught profound lessons and priceless experiences that allows him to have one common treasure of love for family, culture, and belief that happiness is the goal. Sid currently resides in Henderson, Nevada, 
with his wife, five children, and four grandchildren. Welcome, Sid. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Carl and uh, Naki. Just wanted to say it's an honor and a privilege. Um, I've always uh, shared the uh, perspective that we actually do not have one foundation and where a lot of the Polynesians and Pacific Islanders can be able to go to. So this is absolutely uh, uh, needed and warranted and uh, grateful to participate. And I like um, uh, Diala uh, also share the same that I'm not a, uh, a person that normally speaks and debates. Um, however, like everybody else, I, I just love to be able to share my perspectives um, as a Polynesian, as an American, um, as a father, and as a uh, as a son. And uh, the uh, the importance I just like to leave in regards to uh, just my perspective is that um, from the past lies the future. Um, everything that we know, everything that we've been taught, and everything that we love. Uh, basically uh, has that perspective. So with this opportunity, I just, I, I love being part of this uh, um, collaboration for our communities as well as for our people. So thank you for having me. You said, thank you. going backwards. Okay, and our final panelist um, for the current president and vice president Pence is Rudy Pamantuan. Rudy is the managing director of Sherman Worldwide, an international affairs advisory firm where he leads the company's efforts. Prior, Rudy served on President Donald Trump's transition team and was an appointee for President George W. Bush, serving as chairman of the President's Advisory Commission on Asian American and Pacific Islanders. Rudy currently lives in Henderson, Nevada with his wife and three boys. Welcome, Rudy. Thanks, Carl, and thanks, Naki, and uh, special thanks to Poly by Design. Um, you know, there's not a lot of opportunities, especially with the pandemic, to have the community get together and chat about issues. So thank you for giving us a platform to do that, and I look forward to the, the exchange. And, you know, just a reminder to the all that even though we may be on different teams, uh, after elections, we're all one big family. So it's right. all about the community first, and uh, I look forward to our discussions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to go to um, I, I had some acknowledgements here. Um, I would like to acknowledge and thank Maury Monamea for coming up with this concept for our community. This really grew out of um, this grew out of posts and messages on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, that's the genesis of us all being here today um, on this platform was Maury's idea. So thank you, Maury. I'd like to thank Talavo Almavai for all of his hard work making the connections happen. Um, he was the go-between for a lot of us on here today mm -hmm. and creating the awesome flyers that you saw on social media yesterday. Um, I'm also extremely grateful for our two fact checkers today, uh, Kevin Donovan. Um, Kevin volunteered late yesterday. So. <laughs> Um, he is here to help us um, get the facts straight if we have questions about that. Thank you, Kevin. And Polly by Design's very own Nicole Johnson. Um, this is one of those things when your spouse is doing it, you just get volunteered, voluntold. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. Voluntold. Voluntold. Uh, there you go. So as, we have in the family in the background moving everything around for you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, as we said earlier, we're not professional moderators. They're not professional fact checkers, but we're all going to do our best today. So real quickly, rules of engagement. Um, each panelist will have two uninterrupted minutes to answer the question, and then the moderator will announce the next panelist to speak. Actually, we are going to announce all four in the order for that question. So you'll hear what order you are in after we ask the question. At the end of two minutes, if you are still talking, you will hear this. You won't hear hammer. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say what? Hammer? Naki. We have. So Naki has an alarm. And if you keep talking, Naki is the mute button police this morning. She's not like Chris Wallace. She can push the button. <laughs> She's not <laughs> to use it. So uh, can, you, can you do that one more time? Because I didn't hear it. Naki. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> um, 
So there's the, the rules of engagement. I don't think that anything, this is gonna de evolve into anything like what we saw uh, on Tuesday. So let's get into it. Um, the first topic is the debate uh, that we had on Tuesday. So after sitting through 90 minutes of what I personally consider the worst presidential debate I can remember, um, after all the interruptions and all the yelling and multiple people talking at once, when it all came down to it, President Trump spoke for 39 minutes and Vice President Biden spoke for 37 minutes. I think there was a lot of belief that it was a lot, there's a lot bigger difference than that. So they basically spoke for the same amount of time. Uh, I don't believe that in today's day and age, debates change very many people's minds uh, about who they're gonna vote for. I'd haz hazard a guess that our panelists' minds were not changed either. I would believe that Sid and Rudy were Trump voters going in and Trump voters coming out. Uh, and Lay and Dela were Biden voters coming in and Biden voters coming out. So the question is, do you think that your candidate won the debate? And if so, why? We will start with Mr. Liu Fao and then uh, Ms. Tawali'i, Tawali then Mr. P Pamantuan, and then Ms. Nomaea. Mr. Liu Fao, please start. Well, I'm going to share this where I stand in regards to uh, the support for uh, my president. Um, I, uh, I believe that uh, he was getting out some, some major points in regards to um, policies. Uh, I think in regards to the overall um, bantering back and forth, uh, the aggressiveness, um, I'm going to say as far as for the country, uh, which causes division, the country doesn't win. We do not win. Um, but having said that, um, there's, a, there's a perspective that for, uh, for us in regards to what policies do, people can say what they want to say and promise what they want to promise, but, but at the end of the day, it's what they get done. So the actions of, uh, of our president um, speaks very clearly um, and then I would just say that uh, having seen the actions of uh, Vice President um, Biden and throughout his career, uh, his actions speak for itself, uh, which also does not show and note much um, as far as the policies that, uh, that he has brought forth and changes that uh, as Americans that change their lives. So in regards to, uh, to that aspect, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, just share that I believe the President of the United States um, is in a fight for his life, and, and which really is for, fight for the country's life. And so on that platform, I will stand behind the policies that he's uh, instituted and that has benefited uh, all of us as Americans. Thank you hear me? I'll go ahead and start my time. Thank you, Sid. So I will go ahead and just begin by saying, I think that my family won the debate that just happened because I will self-report. We absolutely, absolutely, and me personally, um, came into that particular day knowing where my vote will stand and stay. So here's where I'm at. My personal experience is such that I'm tired. These last four years have been grueling. And I did not believe that particular night I was going to see or hear anything that was going to advance or change my mind about where these two um, leaders stand. So to give you context, my daughter actually works in Virginia on a Fair Maps campaign. She had to come home for a family emergency. She's been here and she's been working day in and day out from the top of the morning till late night working on Fair Maps for Virginia, a constitutional amendment that will be on the ballot in November. Listening to her speak to a nonpartisan issue, a nonpartisan issue that is meant to protect citizens so that maps can be drawn in fair ways that do not put um, minorities or those who are in the underserved in the margins. It, it's been important, it's been enlightening. And listening to her every day try and work through this before she has to go back to finish this work um, as she's doing things, I guess this is a plug to say, a vote on yes in Virginia that includes citizens in the process. 
makes the process transparent and ends partisan gerrymandering is very important to me and it should be important to all of us. So what we chose to do instead, because it is uh, apple harvest time in Utah, is we took that time as a family to look inward, to take a self-care mental health break and to have a whole apple family harvest that evening. Now, what I can tell you, there is no way I'm missing the debate that will be happening in Utah next week between um, Vice President Pence and Senator Kamala Harris. So uh, I will say for me particularly, as I think about the debate and why I'm here today, as a hiring manager for many years and thinking about holding a budget to account, the integrity of my company's mission and values, the client satisfaction, coaching, development, and performance of my employees, this president at this time, 45, he is not fit. He would have been on a behavioral action plan and he would have been fired within the first year of employment um, for his disruptive and harmful ways. So for me, I do not believe that he's supportive of all of our people. I was not going to go into it to listen and have him double down so I could hear it again. But again, I will be watching the vice presidential debate next week. Thank you. Uh oh, what happened here? Should I just go right into it? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, 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 I kind of follow Dela's uh, position on the debate. I, I missed part of it, and I made it a point to watch a lot of the highlight on the highlight reels, right? But what I think what was uh, interesting about it is it showed that there was a clear uh, uh, difference between uh, President Trump's policies and Biden's proposed policies. In the three areas that the American people are most curious about now, especially during the pandemic, is you know the economy. And prior to the pandemic, the United States had unbelievable record-breaking market highs, historic lows in unemployment for women, Blacks, Hispanics, and Asian American and Pacific Islanders. And the American people want the economy open back up so that we can continue, continue that trend. Secondly, on law and order, the president sits very firmly and aggressively uh, against the rioting and the protesting that's occurring, uh, causing murder, violence, and destruction throughout the country. Uh, as the president had indicated, uh, many law enforcement unions and organizations and associations have changed their support and now are uh, representing and, and, and supporting the president. Um, and finally, on education, uh, there's a lot of states out there that currently have schools that are closed. There's a lot of distance learning. Uh, and once they're open, there's many children uh, that are tied to failing schools. President Trump has uh, stated uh, forcibly that uh, he supports parental choice and with parental choice is school choice. And so in those three areas that are most important to American people right now, the economy, law and order and education, I believe the president has a track record of strong support in where the majority stands and looking forward uh, has great policies uh, that he'll continue to pursue and implement in the next four years. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Ms. Nomaea. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I do agree with Sid in his comment of um, the nation did not win that night. The nation did not win. And, you know, we all witnessed, except for Dela, who was the smartest one of us all, mm. um, that we saw three old men screaming at each other. No one really listening, no one being able to get out their point or clarify their stance. So how anyone walked out of understanding any policy, whether it be economy, law and order or education or the handling of coronavirus, I honestly do not know how anyone walked out with a clear understanding to make an informative decision if they are still on the fence. I mean, there's so many of us who are very set in who they're gonna vote for and the things that they stand for with this nominee. And um, I think uh, to quote one of uh, the um, uh, newscasters, that was a hot mess inside of a dumpster fire, inside of a train wreck. And he didn't differentiate between the Republican side or the Democratic side, Biden or Harris, it was, as another one said, a uh, ish show. And forget about the lack of decorum. Like there was a lack of just because 
a human decency and having uh, just a functioning adult who speaks coherently. We could not get anything out of either side. And it was sad. I was, I was very, very disturbed afterwards. So I think, I hope we can have a better one the next time around. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, if there are points that uh, any of the panelists would like to address or rebut that has been made, um, I would just ask that if you do have one that you would like to address that you um, speak to the person, so name the person that, that has the point and what the point is so listeners know what the issue is that's being discussed. So I'll open it up to anybody that wants to rebut points made by the other side. And if not, that's okay too. I do have a question for Rudy on the economy. Um, you know, I keep hearing uh, Trump say that, you know, the economy's turning the curve, we're coming out of it, you know, COVID is under control and, you know, things are getting better. And I think Mason, mainly he's talking about the stock market where the majority of us, who has stocks? Like who, who really has that uh, ability to set that money aside to um, invest. Not a lot. So the stock market to a lot of us just means, can I get into a market to stock up for food for the week? So we're like really not even speaking on the same language. So I, I don't see the economy roaring back like he says. And, you know, I, I, I didn't understand that comment as well. And as far as law and order, I, I still need a definition of what he means by law and order because there are rioters on each side and then there are peaceful protesters on each side. And to categorize either side as being one more than the other is just not true. It's just not true. So that's just my perception of what I see. Who's not for law and order? But when we don't have that defined by this president, um, that's concerning. Thank you, Leigh. Um, so, Rudy, the, there's a, that's a fair question. Is the booming economy that Trump talks about, um, is it participated uh, in by all? Because I do get 401ks and, and the stock market is up, but is that, um, is that something that, that all of America is sharing in? Yeah, good question. And I, and I would say that not all of America is uh, participating in the, the turnaround and the rebound uh, with this pandemic. And, you know, when you look at the statistics and you look at the numbers, you'll find that states that are governed by Republican governors are, are bouncing back much quickly as opposed to uh, states that are governed by Democrat governors, right? Um, a lot of that has to do with the restrictions on, on small businesses and organizations that, that just want to get back to work. There's a lot of people out there that are tired of being locked up in their homes and, and wanting to get back to work. Uh, but uh, a couple points, because there are a couple of questions that were asked. With respect to the, the stock market doing well, um, there are people that have retirements and pensions and what have you, and that, that, that relies greatly on how the markets are doing. But beyond that, uh, having uh, good stock markets also dictate what lending institutions will do, what banks will do. And so access to capital to those that need capital to start their small businesses, uh, the ability to reinvest money to create more jobs, you know, there's a there's a spillover effect when the stock market is is doing well, and then with respect to law and order, um, you know, the one concern that we have is that uh, I do agree that there are there is violence on the extremes on all sides, but there's only one party that's asking to defund the police and change the way that law enforcement is approached in our country, and so when we see high growth in violent crimes throughout major me metropolitan areas, uh, I live in Nevada. There was an article that just came out that we saw an increase in violent crimes. Um, there's a reason for that. And a lot of that is the rhetoric of the far left. And, and, and I think that's why middle America is, is making law and order a forefront issue in this coming election. Ultimately, people want to be safe, you know, but when it comes to the economy, when it comes to education and across the board, none of that can be achieved in great success unless we first take our streets back and we bring law and order. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, we will definitely, we're gonna discuss the social unrest um, in a different topic, but those are all things that are on America's mind. Um, 
Any other address to address? Sid, were you, did you have something to say? I think Sid might be frozen up. You there? Yeah, Carl, can you hear me? Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Did yes. you your hear connection me? has been- Okay, awesome. just wanted to let you know that I'm, yeah. I, I have some major connection issues that uh, have been going on ever since uh, I moved in this house. So I apologize if you see me keep on going in and out, not able to go in slow as well. Um, but I do want to just mention in regards to the media um, that, uh, you know, it was a hot mess and uh, uh, a uh, dumpster fire, you know, all, all rolled into one. Um, but let's also point out that that actually has come from the media from the left. So um, they did actually end up saying that uh, it was all because of uh, Trump. So I just wanted to mention that, uh, that they did blame him. Fair point. The media definitely plays a piece in this. Okay, we are going to move on to our next topic. Naki, take it away. Okay, awesome. Um, so our next topic is COVID-19. Um, President Trump has been criticized by the left for moving too slowly and accused of downplaying COVID-19. We are still without a vaccine and parts of our country are still in different forms of restrictions from what we knew as normal life. America is reeling and looking for solutions and action. My question is, why should America trust your candidate to deal with COVID-19? And we're gonna start with Dela, then Rudy, and then um, Leah, and then Sid. So Dela, uh, go ahead. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. So, you know, in spite of the threat and the warnings from intelligence agencies and health officials, it absolutely has been frustrating that we are at the forefront um, as far as leader, the leader in cases and deaths. So 7 million uh, cases, over 7 million cases, and then over 200,000 deaths. And while the United States represents only 4% of the global population, the country has had 21.7% of the world's confirmed cases. I do want to talk about what this means to Utah, because I'm so proud of the Pacific Islander community and how they have mobilized to go ahead and address this at the local level. And with um, Vice President Biden's plan, which I think is tremendously outlined at his page about what he would do. Um, it's exciting and I feel good about it. And I, it, it, again, it just gives me peace of mind uh, in the safety components of that. So if I could just give you some last, uh, some most recent updated statistics for Utah. Um, 2,747 Pacific Islanders have contracted COVID-19. 29 cases in the last 24 hours. The Pacific Islander case rate 3.7 times higher, the overall state. So here in Utah, 306 Pacific Islanders have been hospitalized for COVID-19. That's the second highest hospitalization rate of all races and ethnicities in our state. There's been one hospitalization in the last 24 hours and we have a hospitalization rate of 2.1 times higher than the overall statewide rate. And 25 Pacific Islanders have died of COVID-19 in Utah since this all began. So the Pacific Islander death rate is 1.5 times higher than the overall statewide rate. And what we learn and we know, thank you for the time check, Carl, um, is that uh, the Biden and Harris team plans to go ahead and increase testing, create a pandemic testing board, create a US Public Health Job Corps, then to place the Defense Production Act, um, American source manufacturing and restart a package for small businesses to cover the cost of operating safely. What I really liked as I close, because I think my time's almost out, is that they, there is the idea to establish a racial and ethnic disparities task force proposed by Senator Harris, which will transition to infectious disease and racial disparities um, so it will be sustainable and ongoing. So this is why he has my vote. He's a planner, he's a coalition builder. He relies on science. So does Senator Harris and they rely on experts. We would not have to have to have lost as many people as we have 
We had acted more swiftly and stayed connected to the who and okay. followed what scientists say. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Mackie, who is next? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Rudy is next and then Leigh and then Sid. Great, thank you. Um, you know, prayers out to everyone that's been uh, diagnosed with it and have lost family. Uh, I think regardless of whoever side we're on, we all agree that it's a tough time for everyone across the board. Uh, with respect to action by the president and the reason why I support him was, you know, back earlier this year, uh, when a lot of folks uh, and the experts said that over 2 million people, 2 million Americans would die, um, uh, you know, the president did take a stand and right away mobilized action. He built the world's largest testing system from nothing. So to imagine to go from a worldwide pandemic and to create the testing infrastructure out of scratch, that doesn't happen overnight. And it's something that he swiftly has done. He enacted mitigation measures to slow the spread. When uh, Biden and many of those at the far left uh, spoke against uh, the president closing down the borders, specifically China. Uh, he was called a racist and xenoph a xenophobe for closing down the borders. But that uh, that move uh, mitigated a lot of this, the increased spreading that would have occurred, that would have created the, what the experts said, over 2 million deaths. Uh, he mobilized a public and private sector uh, effort to secure the needed supplies. Early on when people talked about the need of ventilators and PPEs in the various states of high concentration of early diagnosis, we saw that it ended up being a surplus. There are a lot of extra ventilators, there are a lot of extra and boxes of PPEs that were later on uh, sent out to other countries in need. Um, finally, he's launched a, a, a very high speed efficient delivery of vaccine and therapeutics in record time. Um, to, to, to work on a vaccine, he has made a commitment that it would happen and it would come out within the next month to come out with a vaccine from a unknown uh, disease or virus uh, in record time, it's amazing. And finally, one last point I wanna bring out, he addressed this pandemic from a holistic standpoint. It wasn't just about health, uh, it was also about the economy. And there were many small businesses and employees that were made unemployed. And so through his efforts and leadership, he fast-tracked uh, small business loans uh, that are considered grants and forgivable loans to small businesses that were shut down based on, based on uh, their financial needs and then fast-tracked uh, PUA and unemployment to those that were made unemployed as a result of the pandemic. So uh, across the board, um, right. there's some folks that may say that Biden may have a plan, but I would take uh, action over a plan any day. And the president has shown uh, through his management. We got to uh, stick current to the pandemic. Thank you, he's done a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All good points, Rudy. Um, uh, each one of you, you know, just to circle back, like clarify that how many people do we have in the world? Anyone, anyone? 7.5 billion people in the world. And let's retract those statistics that we brought forward. The US is four, one, two, three, four percent of that 7.5 billion people. But we have over 20% of the cases. How much do you need to read into that? This president did not take this COVID seriously. Had he did, he would have come out as soon as he knew about it. it you know, he can say all day long that he shut down the travel ban from China. But even after he did that, almost a half a million people still traveled between China, Europe, and the US. And that's a fact. So you can't tell me definitively that that actual shutting down China travel made any difference. Now, look at today. We, we used to be able to travel all over the place. Countries don't even want us to come into their countries anymore. We can go to like four countries. I don't know, I'm exaggerating on that. Fact check me on that. But literally I can't go where I need to go as a business owner with companies all over the world and internationally and, and nationally. So 
you know, to say that this president handled this pandemic with urgency and fever and uh, truth is not true. He, he sardined people into rallies. He did not enforce masks. And look what we have today. I know we're hitting that. That's all I have to say on that. Thank you, Lay. All right. Well, I just basically want to say that I'm glad that we do have fat checkers because <laughs> some of the thoughts that I've heard uh, definitely need to be fat checked um, because we're talking apples and oranges. Uh, first of all, um, we're talking about uh, if, if we're talking about the protest versus rallies, then let's call it what it is. Okay, that anybody, if they're susceptible of getting sick then they're going to be able to get sick um, in regards to whatever the illness is. And I'm just going to let you know that uh, as a um, to uh, have a lot of these uh, Pacific Islanders and Polynesians uh, and do the things that we were doing. Well, I just want to point out that Utah is a Republic state. And so they're not closing things down and they're able to do those things uh, because we all uh, believe that this pandemic, this COVID-19, which everyone agrees is absolutely real. Uh, I want to say that was actually. Um, Wait, did, I'm sorry, you're breaking up so bad. Uh, I actually con uh, contracted in February. Point that I want to make is. Oh. I think we lost Sid. Oh, remember. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. Oh, can you, you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Oh, that's much All right. better. All right. Sorry about that. So um, I'm going to try to figure out uh, a new plan to uh, to move. Um, but um, I don't know what part you heard or you last you heard. Contracted COVID-19. So that I, I contracted COVID-19 and uh, basically uh, uh, exposed my family to it. Uh, exposed others because at the point in time I was actually at work county, like I said, and so um, I'm in contact with a lot of people. Uh, the point is, is that even though that I got it um, and in exposing my family, we got through it uh, in a very short time, which is means that five days that we got through it. I was sick within five days that I got through it. Uh, the point is, is that, that this is not a a black plague as it is far left is making it to be. It's like you can catch it, but you're not going to die from it. But those who are susceptible to it because they have illnesses, of course, take the precautions. Thank you, Sid. Um, thank you so much. So um, it, does anyone have any, would like to rebut? And if so, please address the speaker and, and the point you want to address. Okay. Yeah. I would like to. Um, I think I'll start first. Uh, with um, the comment uh, from Rudy. So um, thank you for what you had to share, Rudy. I'll start there. You know, the president did what a president's supposed to do. <laughs> when you're faced with crisis, you're supposed to get in there and start doing the work. He did not do that from the beginning when we had all the warning signs. So I do not applaud him for doling out checks, for organizing and getting things into people's hands. I love living in Utah because Utah being a red state, People know how to come together truly from all sides of the aisle to take care of our citizens. So I would just say that I disagree. <laughs> the president did what any president's supposed to do. He just did it way later than we all, we could have prevented and avoided a lot of things. Um, Sid, I'm really glad that your family recovered. I mean, the truth of the matter is who wants any type of viral disease? I mean, so to say that we'll get through it, 
um, and it can take out populations of people who don't have access to care. So said I will say about the president, what I do appreciate is the dignity and the respect that Vice President Biden and uh, Senator Harris offered to the family to recover. I thought putting aside the vitriol and making sure that they put our country first to say, look, you're the commander in chief. Let's make sure that you're okay and recover quickly. I so appreciated that. And that's what I'm looking for in a president. I'm looking for someone who's presidential. Now, do I believe that this president would have afforded anybody else the same? Who's left, who's blue, who's liberal? No way, because we just don't have someone who pulls us together to join and is looking out for every citizen. And the fact of the matter is he has access to a drug that hasn't even gone through a clinical trial. Can the rest of us say that? The uninsured, those who have insurance with high deductible health plans, would these things be paid? Most insurance insurers do not pay for things that are not FDA approved. So that is privilege. That is the difference between the health disparity gap, the wealth gap, and the race gap. Thank you. I do have one point as well. Thank you, um, everyone. When I believe it was um, Sid who had stated that, or it might have been Rudy, I apologize, that you know the president had to start with empty cupboards, had to start from scratch. That is not true. Obama and Biden knew that there would be soon. It's not if it was when a global pandemic would show up on our front doors. So they put that, that committee in place and those people worked on preparing for this. And one of the first things that uh, Trump and Pence did when they came into office is they politely excused the whole organization who was preparing and um, strategizing for this very time in our in our life in in the life of the the global economy the and the U.S. So to say he had bare cupboards that's offensive. That's just not true. Thank you. I think going forward, we're going to limit the, uh, after this question, we're going to limit the rebuttals to a minute so that um, we kind of move after after we have our time to, to speak on that. I think that one thing that I do want to ask, um, if in 30 seconds, each of you can uh, make a response to um, what is your opinion and position on the people who have wished death on President Trump that are saying, I hope he dies from COVID-19. If in a very brief minute, um, you could you can answer that. Um, it's probably a short answer, but I would like to get through that because that's out there on social media. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's something that we need to quickly talk about. So let's start with, uh, I just got timed out. My own. <laughs> Let's start with the. Let's start with Rudy. That's great. Um, could, uh, I, I will say that I think we all agree. I think both sides of the aisle and to the extremes, there are offensive people across the board. So, uh, what that person said and what they stated, uh, I think, is terrible. Uh, where she stands politically, I'm not going to hold against her. I think we all equally can agree that there are offensive people on both sides of the aisle, right? Um, that being said, could I just respond to a couple things regarding the coronavirus from the previous? rebuttals? I'll be real quick. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, on the on the topic on the empty cupboard issue, um, there was an issue with respect to when the uh, Obama Biden folks uh, addressed the swine flu issue, there was massive usage of the PPEs. So a lot of masks and ventilators, what have you were uh, utilized during that time. Unfortunately, what happened was through funding, uh, those coffers weren't refilled. And so there was a, a little bit of a deficit of uh, materials and, and necessities in that regard. Uh, with respect to America- So is it empty cupboards or a little bit of a dis deficit? And why was there a little bit de deficit? Because there was no more um, committee to continue on the fight of global um, pandemic force. I could see your point, but if, if, if the Trump administration was stepping in and there was a uh, amount of missing inventory, uh, that wouldn't be the fault of the person stepping in. It's, it, was, it was used and it just was never filled back up. I disagree. 
And in, with respect to testing, uh, the United States, uh, in comparison to the rest of the world, may have a higher concentration. But a lot of it also has to do with the fact that we have more tests uh, uh, being initiated and deployed to our population. Uh, we've got countries like China that probably have a higher percentage, uh, but they haven't been very truthful in their numbers, as well as other countries. And then with respect to the travel ban, the travel ban was was uh, for foreigners. Uh, if you were a Chinese American, of course, we were not going to uh, let you not come back to the country. So as long as you were American and you were in foreign land, uh, the president did allow you to come back. And then one last point on the on the statistics with with respect to deaths. Again, experts had claimed that early on America would see two million deaths. Thanks to the actions of the presidents, that was minimized. Now, the current statistic that's out there that are being claimed is 200,000 deaths. But that includes core comorbidities, right? And so if you look at those that passed away from coronavirus on its own, you find that the number is less than 2,000 in America. Yeah, I'd need that to be fact-checked because that 2 million keeps coming up and no one knows where that comes from. But it's significantly um, further away from 200,000. So... So are we to be, oh, thank goodness it's not 2 million. It's only 200,000. But let me add to that. It's only less than 2,000 if you look at those that died specifically only by coronavirus. The 200,000 includes some type of comorbidity uh, that, that they were already afflicted with a pre-existing condition. And that you're okay with that statistic because who does not have a underlining um, health issue? Really? No, I'm, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't classify and say that I'm okay with it, but there's a stark difference between claiming that 2 million people are going to die versus less than 2,000. Let's one is, be clear. One, one's critical. Sorry. Sorry. I'm going to be respectful. <laughs> I'll mute myself. Let's do that. Let's do that. <laughs> so, so Rudy, I did just want to ask though, you know, the threat came from Europe. So closing borders, it came from Europe. It came from Italy to New York, not from China. So it's, it's feeding in to the xenophobia and what we do to other countries. So um, I'll go ahead and just leave that there. I'll set it there. Uh, but closing the borders, which was smart to do again, to go ahead and protect everybody by state and wearing of masks and safe social distancing. But again, there were so many things that could have done, we could have done uh, preventively beforehand. And then when you say that there wasn't money there, who cut the funding? Why was the funding cut for exactly what Lay just said, which was about this watch group for global pandemic and we left the who. So uh, the other side, but I'll just say very quickly, definitely do not wish the leader of our country, any ill harm or his wife or his family. But I will tell you again, the last four years have been grueling and have made me more dark hearted than I care to be. As Pacific Islanders, we come to a space, I love how Sid opened it from a place of love mm -hmm. and how Rudy said, we are one family when we're done. And that's what I find frustrating is I would like to have this inalienable right to be happy and to take care of my family and to contribute to society and uh, to be looking out for others. And this particular person does not allow me that peace of mind and that peace of spirit. So it was not in 30 seconds or one minute, but what I can say is as dark as I can feel at times for what this person is doing, um, which is a crumbling of our society and how we treat each other as humans, I do not wish him death. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We're gonna move on to our next question, Carl. So I just have a, a quick, um... Uh, favor to ask. I'm trying to actually load on to my cell phone if you okay. guys can accept me so that way I don't get interrupted. Okay. Well, we have had though as feedback when there's two accounts on. Yeah. Uh, we get a lot of echoes. So I'm going to accept that, um, let you in on your phone. Um, and then I'll close this one here. Yeah. To drop one of them. So here we go. Thanks. All right. I am going to move on to uh, foreign policy. Um, when Joe Biden was the vice president um, for the eight years with Obama, we were at war of some type for all eight years. Under a Biden-Obama administration, we launched airstrikes against no fewer than seven countries. Obama vowed to end wars, but he was unable to do that completely before he left office. 
The Trump administration has experienced conflict with North Korea, Iran, the Middle East, and the rest of the Middle East, um, and has been at odds with China. The question is, why is your candidate's foreign policy plan the right one for America? We'll start with Rudy, and then we will go to Lay, and then Sid, and then Dela. Rudy, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, I think our uh, President Trump's uh, foreign policy plan, based on his previous results and and plans for the future, definitely sit right with the American people. Uh, you know, let's look at some uh, let's look at some of the successes. Just recently, a couple of weeks ago, there was a Middle East peace uh, a treaty that was signed. I mean, for decades, uh, there's been war going on in the Middle East, and for the first time a president was able to get Israel and Arab nations to sit together and sign a treaty that they would they would create peace. Uh, when it comes to the various terrorist organizations that are out there, including terrorist organizations that grew during the previous administration, uh, our president took a stance with the military and support with them and actually defeated uh, terrorist organizations around the world. Uh, finally, when it comes to Iran, the previous administration had offered a couple billions of dollars to, to the regime uh, in a treaty. Uh, we rescinded that uh, under the auspices that if they were gonna continue supporting terrorist or organizations around the world, uh, we could not placate to that and offer that. Uh, the president has a track record of pulling troops from hot spots and focusing on ending wars. This is one of the few presidents of the United States that has not engaged in any type of war uh, for the first time in many years. And I think that if you want peace and prosperity, President Trump is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you, Rudy. Yes, there, there has, I acknowledge um, the push towards the treaty um, that was just signed on uh, September 15th how enforceable that is and what that looks like in the future is still yet to be seen. Um, I think my take on um, foreign policy has actually been a little bit more jaded because I'm seeing him cozy up with dictators and, um, and uh, kind of take on their persona and their characteristics more than, uh, you know, a leader of a free world. And that's concerning, especially in light of the accusations that are coming forward with what uh, Trump may or may not owe to foreign um, entities and how that put, puts the U.S. at risk when, you know, his foreign policy is a whole different language than what we're used to um, going out and creating the treaties and creating some balance and some type of peace across the, the globe. His is more um, seeking and reaching out to these people who have these powers that are unlimited. And, uh, you know, right now we're sitting with um, Putin in an election where he just, um, you know, all of a sudden his running mate is in a coma because he's poisoned and he's not going to adhere to the time limit of, you know, a leader. And then we start hearing that coming out of, you know, uh, Trump's mouth that, you know, he might not just leave. It might not just be two um, terms or three, like, I, I need to think about this, what I want to do. Those are the words coming from a dictator, from, from you know, countries that don't have democracy. Thank you, Leigh. Uh, that's pretty okay. scary. Thank you. Thank you. Sid, we saw two of you. We thought you were trying to, to multiply and gang up. <laughs> I know. I thought you were trying to gang up on the girls. <laughs> Trust me, I'm going to need 10 of us or 100 <laughs> of us to gang up on them. <laughs> um, but uh, I, uh, I apologize in regards to, I've only heard uh, bits and pieces of what's going on. Uh, please tell me what the, the question and for the, is it the foreign policy? Sid, the question is, why is your, uh, why is Trump's foreign policy the best one for America? Yeah. 
Hughes is on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear okay. you. So in regards to the uh, foreign policy, um, what I, I <laughs> love what uh, President Trump has done was actually uh, brought uh, different uh, countries together that has been uh, fighting and, and feuding um, massive deaths on both sides uh, for we're talking centuries. Um, talking about the uh, um, uh, Israel and uh, you know the uh, United uh, Emirates as well as uh, other countries that uh, that are affected there in the Middle East. Um, I, uh, I love the fact that uh, he went out to uh, North Korea and uh, met with uh, um, uh, Kim Young Jung. Um, I love the fact that uh, he meets with uh, with uh, with uh, Putin, with uh, uh, the uh, uh, the British, um, you know, prime ministers, uh, and a lot of these people, uh, you know, for whatever reason, you can speculate from A to Z. Uh, don't give him the respect because he's not a politician. Uh, he's a person that I see um, that has the gravitas of going to these places and saying to them, what can we do to make this happen? What can we do to uh, uh, to be able to, to bring everyone together? So in regards to uh, the, uh, the policies, as in regards to um, you know, where the country stands, um, we can support our president or we can continue to be divisive and unsupportive uh, just through uh, hatred. And I just wish that that's what we see uh, from uh, those who support Trump. Thank you. Thanks, Dad. Dayla. Thank you. So I'm a little confused. Um, I guess I would say in terms of foreign policy, when it comes to, again, I'll just um, converse with what, or actually just reference what Lay had said, you know, communicating and getting together with dictators is not the way to go. We are at risk, our country is at risk, our elections um, and uh, questioning Russian interference, Vladimir Putin, most leaders don't go visit Kim, Kim Jong-un without some sort of, what are we going to talk about? What are we going to try and accomplish together? But there is thought that a visit to him only legitimized him as a dictator and uh, only, again, it put us in a place to be concerned about nuclear weapons out of that particular space, as well as in Iran. So what I'm concerned about for Biden and why I can get behind him is because he understands this. We've lost our footing as a power. We've lost our footing as an ally. We left NATO which is uh, pulls us all together to make sure that we can protect the de democracies that we have and also the citizens. There's some repair that needs to happen there. I also consider a part of foreign policy, the Paris Climate Agreement. I mean, we have a war to protect our planet. So um, I, I stand by Biden for the holistic approach of these things, but I will say it is nice to be in peacetime. So I can definitely get behind with what everybody's saying is that it's very nice when we think about how many American Samoans list in the military, how many veterans we have in our Pacific Islands or people who are enlisted, if they do not have to go to wars that do not make sense, absolutely I can get behind that. It's not just about the now, it's about the future and the fact that we have just lost this respect. We have, uh, we prescribe to some American exceptionalism that we can do everything alone. We can't. We need allies and we need to be at the table with everybody else so that we can make sure that the whole of humanity can sustain itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dela. Um, so we are going to limit the rebuttals to one minute. I do have a question um, for either side because this is a thing that, that, at least uh, it seems to bug me. So when Obama was in office, he had negotiations with uh, Ahmadinejad from Iran and the right vilified him for talking to a dictator, to talking to somebody who's um, the head of what is seen as a terrorist nation. Now that the roles have switched 
and Trump is in office, the left is saying you shouldn't talk to dictators. Am I seeing that wrong or is one side playing one side and then switching sides once that the, the, the positions have switched and there's a different president? I'll throw that to the, uh, to the Republican side, either Rudy or Sid. Does it seem, am I seeing that accurately? When Obama did it, the right didn't like it. They said you shouldn't be talking to or acknowledging dictators. But now that Trump's in office, he's doing the same thing that the right didn't like that Obama did. And my question for the left will be the same thing. Why, why is the position switched? Rudy. Uh, you, you know, I, I just want to say it's it's hypocrisy from the left. But what you'll see is historically in a variety of issues, there's a lot of hypocrisy. And a lot of it is changing the game rules to benefit where, where their position is. But to follow up on a couple quick points, uh, with respect to NATO and other alliances, what we've found is we haven't broken away from them. What we've asked is other nations and allied nations to pay their fair share. For, for, for over decades and centuries, we've been paying and footing the bill from every international institution from the United Nation to the WHO to various military alliances. And all we've been asking for is for our alliances and our allies to pay their fair share. And what we can see in a lot of our military alliances is that through strength, uh, our president has worked with the leaders of Europe and they have all anted up and they're, they're putting more money to protect themselves and our alliances. Uh, the president is about following through with his promises. For decades, every president on both sides of the aisle promised Israel an embassy in Jerusalem. It took President Trump the ability to do that. Uh, many presidents com have commitments of defeating terrorism. There was only one president that defeated ISIS, and he did it within a couple of years. With respect to I Iran, uh, the, you know, the biggest funder of terrorism around the world, the president took the step and, and uh, uh, took down the top general from Iran to send a clear message that America won't tolerate terrorism and harm to democracy and freedom around the world. So our president, through strength, has shown a, a willing commitment and ability to stand firm with allies, and allies are responding by uh, offering greater commitments in their partnerships with our country and our efforts throughout the world. You got to move on. Um, I would ask that, that the participants respect the time limit. We've got a long ways to go. Um, when, I, when, when there's a question on board, don't stack the response. So when I say, why is this hypo hy hypocritical? Um, there's time for rebuttal for the points. We are going to get into that. But if we start answering multiple questions when it's posed, we're going to get into a really hard area to define what the true answer is. So I'll turn it over to either one of the uh, Biden-Harris supporters. The question again is, why was it criticized? Um, why was it okay when Obama spoke to um, a dictator and it's not okay for Trump? And that's the, the question I just posed to Trump supporters is why was it not okay for Obama, but Trump's doing it now? So that's the question for either of the Biden-Harris supporters. Um, I'll take that, uh, Dela. So specifically regarding your question, Carl, it's not that we're saying it's not okay to talk to dictatorship and countries that just do not have democracy, nor will they ever. It's that O'Biden, uh, Obama, um, Obama went to Iran to make a deal to say, you will not continue with this type of nuclear growth. You will stop doing this. You will stop doing that. We will have 24 hour surveillance so that we can ensure that you are complying with this agreement. So when in fact we're, he's uh, interacting with a dictator, it is for a purpose. It is a for purpose for peace and stability across the world, not just to cozy up to them, be like them, exalt them in many cases, and you know, try to transfer our democracy and our republic into any of those types of countries. That's my take on it. And uh, that's where I stand on at least speaking with dictators. Okay. Um, you, points for the foreign policy. And that's really what Rudy was getting into. And I do want you to get into those. Um, I just want to get, do one 
uh, one topic at a time. So uh, if there's a rebuttal point, just call out the, the person um, and the point and we can do that or we'll move on. Awesome. Our uh, next topic is tax plans. Um, the Trump tax cuts of 2018 passed without one Democrat vote of support. Trump claims that these were key in helping to create a healthy and strong economy. Vice President Biden has stated that he wants to roll back these tax cuts and increase taxes overall with an emphasis on the rich. The question is, why is your candidate's tax plan the right one for America's future? We're going to start with Lay, Sid, Dela, and then Rudy. So Lay, go ahead, please. Thank you, thank you, Neki. So as far as our tax plan with Biden, there's a lot that still needs to be hashed out. And the beautiful thing about Biden is he has grown some amazing relationships on both sides, who trust him, who believe him, and who can collaborate with him. So I put a lot of my trust in the fact that when Biden and Harris get into office, which they will, they will be um, grasping to those relationships on both sides of, of um, the aisle to come up with the best scenario. Because today, all um, Trump has done is increase the deficit and increase the space between low, the lower economy um, and those who are the very wealthy. And I was just flabbergasted to see how many of the Fortune 500 companies do not pay a single penny in taxes. And, you know, that is more of what Trump knows and understands. And if there is a tax loop that they're taking advantage of that we don't know about, well, we need to fix that. And uh, I was just watching, a uh, real quick, I was watching um, Ted Cruz. And I don't think I'd ever agree with Ted Cruz on anything, but his tax plan is very simple. Everyone pay 10%, no matter what you make, you make 10%. I'm like, I could get on board with that. I am not you know, closed off to hear you know, some collaboration and get to a perfect place, but the middle class is basically diminished. There's the haves and the haves not, and that needs to change. Thank you, Lay. Sid? Uh, thank you, Neki. So in regards to the, uh, the uh, tax plans uh, in regards to, uh, for our economy, so um, I believe that if you're going to take a look at what Trump is and say that uh, his uh, stimulus has increased. Let's look at the reasons why. So the stimulus, which has to uh, be given out, the first one that uh, I believe it was a uh, uh, 1.2 trillion. The second one was uh, at uh, 2.1, uh, 1.2 trillion. Um, in regards to and, and you can fact check me on the numbers, but my, my point is that when the economy is hurting because we're being closed down by a pandemic, which is not the death plague, um, and people are being forced to suffer um, because we have no work, we're not able to go back. Uh, many states do not open their states. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we're talking about data. they basically have their side uh, or their ways to be able to close these things down. Um, uh, our cities and, and states uh, for the uh, for the agenda. Uh, that agenda is basically to uh, make sure yeah, that I Trump's think. and um, and that's that's my view is that uh, they have been trying to uh, uh, impeach him. They've been trying to uh, to hurt him from the beginning. And Trump has been doing nothing but helping American people. Again, that's my view with Thank the you. policies that he has in place. So, Thank you, Sid. So if we're, okay, so thank you. Dela. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so 
home ownership for the general population in Utah is approximately 70%. It's about 38% for Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islander Utahns. 56% of NHPIs who live in the greater Salt Lake City metro area are rent burdened. They pay more than 30% of the household hold income towards rent. 71% of Tongans living in Salt Lake City are rent burdened. So this is to say that affordable housing, utilities, and food, food insecurities are a big deal. Okay, so if that's a big deal for us here, um, it might be similar situation for people in other states and other cities. The reason why I mention it is because it gets to what Lay is saying. The tax, the taxes that have been put into place, they benefit the wealthy. You know, um, they're getting richer. It's the haves and the have mores at this point. The tax plan that Biden is putting in place, it bolsters the middle class, which is where I sit. I'm lucky to sit here, but I recognize it would probably only take a two to three paychecks for me to be in a situation where very likely I could be in a homeless situation. Um, we are also finding um, that Americans through the pandemic, thank you, Sid, you know, they've lost an income or they could be losing or uh, losing a home or it could be foreclosed. So when we get back to these tax breaks or tax plans, uh, Vice President Biden's tax plans are there to go ahead and help protect the middle class so they can go ahead and sustain because the wages we're making are not keeping track our everyday expenses. They just aren't. And what's also happening is at the highest level, that top percent of wealth, where is that money going? Is it being reinvested into the workers, to us, the essential workers who are carrying everybody? Or is it being sent overseas? Is it putting, being put into innovations? There should be tax. There should still be things that are happening to tax the rich in a way that makes sense that the rest of us can still survive. So that is my comment as far as tax. And when we think about stimulus checks, that is socialism. That is looking out for everybody. So when we get into the right and the left and all the way around and what happens, that's how I would answer that question is I'm looking out for the middle class. That's why he has my vote. Thank you, Dela. Rudy? Yeah, I, I remember at the start of the last election, many of the far left pundits put it out there that if President Trump was elected president, the whole economy in America would crash. And we see, especially pre-pandemic, that that was not necessarily true. Uh, when the president really worked hard with the Senate and, and the House to pass the first major tax reform that was signed in, in the last 30 years. It provided 82% tax relief to middle class families. And this happened through the child tax credit by providing an additional $1,000 per child in tax relief for working parents. So parents that are out there that have children, they know that when they filed their taxes, they had an additional tax credit for that. Uh, it nearly doubled the standard deduction. And for those that did their taxes last year, you notice that doing your taxes was much easier and it was simplified. And there were cuts to small business owners of up to 20%, which allowed them to have more take home to reinvest within their small businesses. I mean, ultimately, when you compare Biden's plan with true action and results, it's easy to, 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 to pick uh, the, the results of that. Finally, uh, the, you know, Biden talks about the Green New Deal. The problem with that is when you start creating incentives for a new industry, uh, alternative energy and renewable energy, and, and therefore, uh, it's almost a gamble, right? So, so the problem with that is he's looking to not only increase taxes, but to create some type of incentive that would cost taxpayer dollars to reinvest in a new industry, and that's a big gamble. So when it comes to the middle class, I like the trend of what I see with respect to the tax reform, and I look forward to more decreased taxes for the middle class. Thank you, Rudy. Would anybody or does anyone have a rebuttal? I think not necessarily a rebuttal, but thanks, Rudy, for your background and your experience as a professional in that particular space. It's always good to learn. So thank you. I did want to add, though, that what I see in Biden's tax plan is the expansion of the child tax credit to $3,000 per child ages 6 to 17, 3600 for children under 6. So it's giving more there. Tax credits that will help working families afford uh, health insurance, tax credits that will help working families afford child care up to 8,000 K, tax credits for seniors, tax credits to help families buy their first homes and build wealth up to 15 K. Home buyers receiving the credit up front instead of waiting to receive when filing taxes and equalizing tax benefits of retirement plans. Your specialist, you're in those spaces to really know tax code, I'm sure, and everything else. But that's what appeals to me. 
So thank you. Thank you, Dela. And uh, I just also, I'd like to share a quick thought. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So um, I want to, okay, I, I want to uh, agree with uh, uh, both with uh, Robin and, and, uh, and Dela that uh, one of the issues that I honestly truly believe too uh, has to do with uh, being a career, a career politician. And so the rich get richer. Um, and that what I truly believe in regards to those who are making, sorry, <laughs> those who are making the decision um, in regards to taxes. So um, again, uh, we have uh, Biden who's been in polit uh, um, the politics for over 40 years, 47 to be exact. And um, now he's going to basically come out and, and bring out these uh, these uh, plans that are supposed to work. So I again, um, that's what I'm looking at. And so is uh, many of the silent majority of uh, Americans are when it comes to um, all of a sudden coming out with a plan that's going to work for, for everybody. But career politicians is what I've always say, uh, shared and believe that uh, uh, we need to change in regards to helping the American people. Thank you, Sid. I, I'd like to um, piggyback on that. I absolutely agree. And I think this is one thing that we all can agree coming from our different perspective backgrounds and um, taxes. But, you know, we're in it. There's the elephant in the room of those big corporations who have paid zero taxes, zero. Like the most, the richest guy in the world, Jeff Bezos, paid zero taxes. Not only did he pay zero taxes, but he got a refund of, and fact check me on this, around $70 million in refunds. And, you know, so we don't have those wonderful tax attorneys who can find all the loopholes, which why are there loopholes? So I am encouraged and I'm excited to see, you know, this candidate um, Biden come in from Scranton, knowing what the middle class is about and having lived through that, um, bring a bigger voice to, uh, address the tax disparity between the classes. I would like to I would like to offer I do agree with Robin that if we could just do a flat 10% tax I think everyone here would agree to do that. Yeah. I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> I think that um, the problem with the flat tax and Rudy would know more about this than me is uh, the extremely poor don't pay 10% in tax. It would hurt the poor far more then it would hurt uh, the rest of the population. When you look at what taxes poor people, extremely poor people uh, pay, it's less than that. So if we were to enact a flat tax across all citizens, um, I think the disparity would be worse for uh, impoverished people than, than people think. I think, but Rudy, you would, know, you would know more than I. I just think that we don't pay equal taxes right now. Um, should be the more you make, the more you pay, but it doesn't always seem that way. Question for, uh, I guess for Robin, uh, because you brought up Jeff Bezos, um, the the opposition would say that Amazon has uh, a million employees. That's a million jobs out there um, that create tax base that um, are buying groceries and all the consumable goods that we buy. Would it, is it something that, you know, some people would say we need five more Jeff Bezos so five million, million more people have those jobs. Is that a, a, a valid argument in your mind or is that still, he's not paying enough taxes? He's not paying any. So it, it, him, just off the top of my head, Netflix, um, Starbucks, like good grief. Just think, you know, the money that we could get just off a of 10%, like forget about 2024 that most of us pay, we could have, you know, addressed homelessness across the country. We could have made sure the education, the public education for every child, you know, is met where they are. I mean, there's so many different plans where all of a sudden, oh, we don't have the money for that. We don't have the money for that. But then there are those, you know, 
top two four percent that pays zero of the taxes and make up how much of the wealth of this country shame shameful makes sense Naki, you're on mute we're gonna move on to our next topic <laughs> sorry about that that's all right uh immigration so Immigration is truly uh, one of the pillars of this country's creation. Um, President Trump has chosen to enforce over 100 immigration rules that, while on the books, were not enforced until his administration took office. He has made a point of being strong on immigration control. Biden is openly opposed to the executive order barring uh, immigration from some majority Muslim countries. Uh, he's against the position against sanctuary cities and has stated he will roll many things back that Trump has currently put in place. The question is, why is your candidate's position on immigration the right one for America? We'll start with Sid um, and then go to Lay and then Rudy. And um, I don't have the next, oh, Dela. <laughs> so go ahead, Sid. All right, well, thank you. So I, I believe that um, his policies for immigration are good because they actually, they work. Uh, they work on being able to keep, uh, keep us balanced through um, making sure that we follow the laws and the, uh, the order that allow these taxes that uh, we pay into um, to basically have a, uh, a reason um, and the reason that I'm referring to is that we are basically paying taxes uh, for those people that um, that are here as immigrants that are here illegally as well in some of the states um, and take uh, like uh, California, the sanctuary uh, state as sanctuary states that uh, that allow the um, illegals to go there for help. I don't have an issue with that personally, because I believe that all lives uh, that matter. I believe that. Um, however, when it comes to taxes, there is a law that is basically put into order. And we have to follow that. And that law is, is through the immigration, that those people, like all of our families, have come here, for those who haven't been born here, um, and I'm sure there's a lot of them that have to go through the same process of getting um, legalized to be here, uh, whether it's through a visa, whether it's through, uh, um, you know, a naturalization or whether it's through being a citizen. So uh, I believe that the immigration, um, the, uh, the immigration in regards to what Trump has set forth uh, is working. And that um, we have problems again, as we talked about homeless, to feed our, our the people that are here, the Americans that are out of jobs, um, and so immigration does work, and it's not fair for those people who are suffering, uh, that don't have work, um, and that are, again, uh, being uh, paid above those who are here illegally. So that's what uh, his policies protect Americans. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Sid. Is that who is that me? It's Dela, oh, Rudy, and then Lay. Okay. My apologies. I thought it was last. I wrote myself down as last. Um, you know, for Biden, who who I often think about, and thank you, Sid. Um, understanding really uh, for the taxes that we pay, how do you go ahead and spread and share the wealth um, put into that? And as you also had recognized um, among many of us, our families who immigrated here, and then also thank you, Carl, we are a nation of immigrants. That's from the very beginning. Um, so um, where I stand for Biden really has everything to do with DACA protections, the dreamers, 
um, that were brought here by their parents um, and didn't have a say, but I find that the dreamers that I meet are contributing to society and have a lot to build upon in the American dream. And who can't um, subscribe to that? So um, for me, uh, why I get behind Biden is because I do have concerns about the dreamers that I know, the dreamers who contribute and the dreamers who shape the America we want to be and the America that we can be. Uh, I also appreciate his vow to protect asylum seekers because with climate change and climate justice, it's where people can go if we don't get a hold of this, everybody is going to be seeking refuge for different reasons if it doesn't have to do um, with human, human rights issues. So um, in terms of immigration, I do understand that it's a problem. It's been problem for years with every administration, um, but where I think me personally, where my experience and where my vote always goes this direction is that I hate the idea of um, sending people away that are dreamers. And then also I just really struggle um, with the way in which the ICE detention centers were put into place and the disgusting and deplorable acts that have happened by separating children from their parents. Um, I think it's a stain and it's a mark on who we are and who we can be. And we are not above other countries in some of these human rights errors and problems, whether it's domestic terrorism or things like this. Thank you. Thank you, Hila. Rudy? Thanks. A um, couple things. Uh, the president looks at immigration as a national security issue, especially when it comes to illegal immigration. And I think it's important to distinguish the difference between immigration that's legal and illegal immigration. And I'm more focused on the, on the legal piece. Um, so we just got to clarify that. Um, the president does support merit-based immigration. And so that being said, um, you know, his tough stance when it comes to the wall and increasing funding for ICE, it's actually increased in the number of arrests and indictments of those that are engaged in human trafficking. I think that's been a major issue uh, that hasn't been addressed, that's being addressed finally now. Um, I, I, so I like his stance on that. And, and we're finding that his stance on illegal immigration is actually polling well with Latinos. Um, because many of them came to this country legally. They, whatever lines they had to deal with, they did so legally. And so uh, they're not big fans of those that are willing to jump, jump the line. Um, the far left, their position when it comes to illegal immigration and the defense of our borders is they want to abolish and defund ICE, um, saying that ICE is a racist group. Well, the, the, the men and women of the Border Patrol of ICE, you know, more than half of them are Latino and descent themselves. But ultimately, I think we're where there's challenges that we all grapple with is the situation with DACA. Um, the Department of Justice years ago determined that the executive order for DACA from the previous administration was not enforceable. And so it's been up in the air. I know the president grapples with it. And I think that this is something that both sides need to get together. I know the president and the White House has taken a position asking Congress to, to address the issue and make immigration a forefront discussion. Um, obviously with a lot of issues that have been going on the last couple of years, it hasn't been a top priority, but moving forward, I think when it comes to Congress stepping up and this, after this next election cycle uh, and with President Trump at the White House, I think we'll find a humane and responsible approach on how we handle DACA. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Larry. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Um, I think, you know, you had said that um, Biden wants to abolish ICE, that that's equivocally not accurate. There's a reform that needs to happen. And, you know, one day you sign up for ICE and all of a sudden you have this overcrowding on the borders and you find yourself babysitting and changing diapers and feeding and it is chaos that that's literally what is happening down there and will a wall help that from what i understand there's i don't know 200 to 300 miles of a wall um i've not quite seen it but if if in fact he is keeping the promise that he campaigned on up and down the u.s and in 2016 he has uh, 2,000 miles more to go. And Mexico is not paying for it. And that seems to have gone on the wayside. So as far as immigration, I, you're, I do agree that 
both sides need to come together and come up with, you know, a collaborative human um, decision on how to handle what, what we have. And I did read an article recently about the farmers down in that area where they had an open call for field workers and most of them were Mexican. There were a lot of white people. By the time it, they ended, there was not a single white person left. And I could reference that article, but they say, oh, well, they're taking the jobs from the Americans. No, they're taking the jobs that the Americans won't do that are beneath them. But you know, these people who come in, they wanna work hard. They wanna be contributing Americans to our society, but they've only been, you know, looked at and treated as less than, and that needs to change. So, and I agree so much of what Dela said about DACA, you know, these guys, it's not their fault. They have to be in school working, no felonies, you know, contributing taxes, but we don't even hold our own young adults to that same standard. What is wrong with that? Like everyone should have to go through the 26 list of things that a DACA um, citizen has to go through to be a, a citizen here in the US, whether you're born here or not. It's pretty interesting. Thank you. Um, do we have any rebuttal? Any rebuttals? Okay. Because uh, <laughs> we want to move on to the next question because time is going and I know you guys don't want to spend all afternoon with us, <laughs> even though I don't mind. It's just, no. I know you have better things to do. So let, let's just go on to the next question. Um, let's see here. We did immigration. We're going to go to treatment of women. Um, President Trump has been accused of rape, sexual assault, and sexual harassment, including non-consensual kissing or groping by at least 25 women since the 1970s. Vice President Biden has been accused multiple times of sexual misconduct of varying degrees. The question is, as women, how do you reconcile supporting your candidate? Also, as a man who has mothers, sisters, daughters, how do you reconcile supporting your candidate? We will start with Dela, then we'll go to Sid, we'll go to Lay, and then we'll end with Rudy. All right, Dela, let's go. Thank you, Naki. It's just not okay. It's not okay, but this is who we have. It's these two, and to participate in the, the process of being an engaged citizen and utilizing this one right that I get to show up and do, I, I will, I will use this vote. But I do, uh, what I look to is allegations of misconduct. That's why we have due process. Um, and so if for both of these people, for Justice Supreme Court Kavanaugh, you know, I mean, it's it's coming everywhere. We've seen it in the last couple of years. It's becoming uh, more visible. Um, what used to be acceptable in the past isn't any longer, and it's it's not okay. So where I have to go in not being a single um, voter issue is I have to look at the other things and the whole holistic piece. I, I believe that I've seen things that, you know, slightly speak to some accountability, but but not in the way that I would like to see really from Vice President Biden. I think there could be more, I'll be honest about that. Um, but, it's, it, but it's something that needs to stop as a woman and with daughters. And, and frankly, this happens to men too, I'm sure. But um, making people feel uncomfortable through behavior that is not okay and that there is not consent, it, it's not all right. But for me, um, I, I believe that Vice President Biden is surrounding himself with people who will hold him accountable to make sure that he does not misstep again and that he does not make light of the situation again. So that is my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dela. Uh, well, thank you, Dela. I appreciate uh, what you just shared in regards to, um, I, I, I would just say in regards to uh, the question that you had asked, uh, um, uh, you ended up uh, sharing uh, Naki that uh, it dates back. Um, I think you said 1970 uh, up to, um, I forgot the other date, but um, 
if we as business owners hire people based on their past, um, we obviously will have, uh, you know, some say, some things that uh, we can agree with that they got past and some things that we don't. Um, having said that, um, you can look at uh, President Trump's, uh, his cabinet, and you're gonna see that he surrounds with some, himself um, not with people that are basically male or female, um, but people who are qualified for the job. And as far as I, as far as I noticed, um, the majority of them are, are women. So having said that, um, qualifications is basically uh, is what allows us as individuals uh, to be able to um, to stand on. Um, so you, if you want to look at who we are today. Um, We'll look at all our mistakes, um, you know, from the past, uh, who made us who we are today on this uh, platform where we can actually speak to one another and to those who are listening. Um, because what we do is that we don't have a one perspective of just saying, well, this, 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 this is the issue. Because I'm sure that we have all been on, on every side of uh, being treated, um, you know, condescendingly to being uh, treated uh, uh, because of our sex or, or our race or, or what have you. So in regards to women and uh, in regards to uh, where I believe that the president has already not only taken the steps um, to make sure that that is not the issue, but uh, you can see what he's done, which is surround himself in his cabinet, uh, again, by the majority of, of, uh, of women who are not only capable and smart and beautiful, um, but you know the, the fact shows that they are. Uh, there are women, and they're they're equal. Thank you. Lay. Okay, you're gonna have to repeat the question because I trailed off with. Okay, work. no problem. Um, I was like, as a woman, how do you reconcile supporting your candidate? Okay, so. There is no reconciliation when it comes to women's rights or um, the Me Too movement, the things that are coming out now. And I agree with both Sid and Dela that times have changed and women are now speaking up and they're now clearly articulating and they have the voice now and they have you know, the power and the security to be able to say, you know, this happened to me and to be able to be taken seriously. So, you know, there's, you know, Maya Angela, we all know her favorite uh, quote is, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. Mm -hmm. So if we want to go back 47 years of Biden's record and 47 years of Trump's whatever business i don't know um we can we can do that year for year and to have that many people come out and say that he has uh you know there's some um claims against him and then to have biden come out and someone say you know what he made me feel uncomfortable he's touchy feely he's huggy you know kissy and you know, not to negate that, but he clearly stepped forward, not once, not twice, but three times, even more that I've seen and apologized and recognized that he understands people need their space and he needs to respect it more. And he clearly articulated his understanding of that and apologized for that. I have yet to hear that from Trump at all. Thank you, Lay. All right, the alarm just went off. Does anybody have a rebuttal or? I think I still need to go. Oh, Rudy, yes, I'm sorry. Rudy. <laughs> That's okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. You know, on, the, on this particular issue, I'd have to go along with Dela. Uh, she brings up a good point. You know, we've got to trust the due, due process, right? Um, 
you know, a long time ago, many decades ago, when I lived in Chicago, a good friend of mine was uh, former chairman Dan Rosenkowski. He was a big Democrat congressman uh, who was chairman of Ways and Means during the Clinton administration. And he ended up getting in some trouble and served some time, but then he got out and, you know, I had a standing lunch with him. And one of the questions I asked him as a former member of Congress is I asked him, you know, would he run again? And he said, without even thinking about it, no way. And I said, why? And he said, there was a, there's a big difference. And he said, the difference was when there were partisan differences, they still focus on compromise and coming up with solutions. Politics of today is focused on trying to put the other person in prison. And when the politics of today is like that, where you're focused on putting other people in prison and demonizing the other side, it's really hard to sit down and, and meet and talk about ideas. And so times have definitely changed. Um, unfortunately, um, you, you can name every elected official or anyone running for office. There's always someone or something coming up near election time that's throwing some type of allegations. Some of it could be true, some of it could be made up. I mean, who knows unless we go through the process. And that's a difficulty. And so it could be anything from corruption to harming women or what have you. All of it is terrible and bad. But I think the challenge is we've got a media that really doesn't do their research. And so as voters, people are in a tough spot. You know, of course, we're going to feel bad about everything that's negative. And of course, it's hard to support candidates that have allegations hurled at them. But that being said, we still have a country to run. And so whether allegations are true or false, uh, whether things happened 40 years ago or what have you, I believe that there should be a process in place to, to figure that out. But in the meantime, with the election around the corner, we have to remember, and it's not an easy decision, right? Um, I don't think anyone's proud of anyone that does anything bad. And if people do things bad that are in our family, we're not proud of that. But you know, we still have Thanksgiving dinner and Christmas, and we still have a country to run, right? So back to your question, how do I feel about it? If the allegations are true, regardless of the candidate, of them doing anything wrong against women, I'm totally against it. And there should be punishment in accordance to that. But while they're all allegations, and since we're in the middle of an election cycle, I just have to go along with who I support, and it's our president. And again, I do that based on his track record. Um, you know, he has more women running uh, or currently appointed to various positions in federal government. Uh, when it comes to unemployment and small business and what he's done for women, he's done great things. So um, that being said, again, there's a lot of allegations out there, but we're in the middle of election process. I lean everything, I push everything for a process in terms of addressing those issues. But from the political standpoint and from an election standpoint, you know, we're picking who's who looks best on paper to move the country forward. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna take a quick break here. I'm and sorry, can I just, two seconds? Yes. Go ahead. We, the question was, what do we think about our candidate and the way women are treated? Neither one of them addressed their candidate. And allegations, I'm sorry, I have videotape of his own voice um, commit like agreeing that he would like to grab women by the you know what that's not an allegation he says I like to go behind the the pageants the Miss Teen pageants and I'm the owner so I can walk back there and nobody asks any other questions so I get to you know peek around and make sure everything's okay Leigh I think the the question was how do you reconcile uh, yeah, I want to know how do they reconcile that? For voting for the the candidate for either candidate, both of them had sexual misconduct allegations. So that was the question, and people were answering how they're not just allegations. Are reconciling that? I'm not. I'm not saying so whether they're allegations. They are allegations. What I'm saying is, with the allegations of misconduct that's out there, how do you, as a woman or as a man, reconcile voting for your candidate? And I don't think either one of them answered it. Well, I did in regards to having the president surrounded himself by, in his cabinet, mostly females. So if they felt the same way you do, Robin, if, if women felt the same way that you do, I absolutely believe 100% that they would not be part of his cabinet. I absolutely think that they would be that disturbed to know that this person is that 
person that you're talking about. So yes, in regards to having things on videotape, having proof, I mean, okay, we're, we're, we're I'm not going to say that that doesn't exist, but it, it exists on both sides. The question is, how do you move forward with that? That was the question. And how do you reconcile him having that on tape, being closely knitted with a accused pedophile? How do you, like, how is that reconciled? I'm not hearing reconciliation. I'm not. So we can move on. Well, the reconciliation is that, again, women who are smart have their own opinions. I would probably offer too the, the it would probably be the same rec reconciliation on the other side with the various videos of Biden inappropriately touching children also. Right. Which again, the he knows he's in front of a million cameras, a bunch of people out in an official event, and he's supposedly, you know, performing pedophilia types of situations when when addressed he clearly took that and took it to heart understood it apologized for it and he not in space people are uncomfortable with that got that he understood that he addressed it i have not seen that happen on the other side Appreciate the way that the question was asked. I will come to you. I think we're scratching the surface of a lot of wrongdoing for many years that was acceptable. It's not going to sustain. There's no way. These types of things, we need to get through this election, um, figure out who it's going to be. These types of things coming forward, people have been harmed um, and have a voice now to be able to say, I'm glad we're at this point. Um, and this is where I get concerned because I do not believe that the president in place right now, whether you are a woman who aligns with them or not, has my best interest in mind. Um, I know that we will have other questions and topics that would address this. I'm sure it will be with the Supreme Court justice discussion. Um, but I do not see him as someone who is looking out for the well-being and the welfare of women and children. It just, unless it's his own. Thank you, Dela. Yeah. Very sensitive topic. Uh, right. I'm gonna switch gears here, take a quick break and get to the information our fact check. What's that? And get to the information that our fact checkers are uh, have looked up. So there was discussion about uh, the travel ban and which countries have, won't allow um, US citizens to travel to their countries. The list is long. There's 33 countries that have banned uh, travel in July, according to Forbes. Um, there was a discussion about the federal stockpile of N95 protective masks um, and whether the Obama administration left, uh, left that unreplenished. So it was the U.S. federal stockpile of N95 protective face mask was largely depleted during 2009 with a swine flu outbreak and was not restocked. So the bottom line is Obama didn't refill the stock after the, wine, the swine flu but Trump didn't refill it either. So it remained empty until we had the COVID-19 issue. Um, let's see. Uh, and I, let me just point out the the point was not that it was depleted. At least I was not making that point. I was making the point that he disbanded the group who would have made sure that we were ready. So that was my point. And they said, someone said, we started from scratch. That's not true. Right. I think that both leaders can take some ownership with that for not replenishing it. Um, and then when he inherited it, he didn't replenish it. So I think the American uh, public is the one that paid the price for uh, that oversight. Um, in terms of Amazon, in 2018 and 2017, um, Amazon paid zero taxes on a respective 11.2 billion and 5.6 billion in profits by leveraging unspecified tax credits and stock-based compensation deductions. From Fox Business News, Amazon pays all the taxes we are required to pay in the U.S. and every country where we operate, including 
paying $2.6 billion in corporate tax and reporting $3.4 billion in tax expense over the last three years. Uh, from Distractify, in 2018, Amazon posted an income of more than $11 billion, but the company paid zero in federal taxes. Um, that year, Amazon received $137 million refund from the federal government for 2017. That's because Amazon actually owed money to the federal government. Hold on, let me back up. Um, President Donald Trump is a frequent critic of Amazon for paying little or no taxes to state and local governments, though the Trump administration 2017 tax cut and job cuts helped to lower the statutory corporate tax rate. So um, that's the report on Amazon. Um, was there a discussion in, about immigration, about cages being built? If there was, I did not. No. no, but uh, cages were built by Obama as mm -hmm. a staging um, situation, not for a housing and leave and forget uh, and let get sick and die. So that's my input on that. And then there was the uh, discussion about the Biden platform. Biden, while both Biden's platform and the list of policy recommendations drafted by the Unity Task Force demand far-reaching immigration reforms, including ending workplace raids, they do not go so far as to say that immigration enforcement would be abolished. And that's from Newsweek. So thank you, Nicole and Kevin, for putting that time in. Um, we are going to go to our, our final question. Um, and then we're gonna, we're gonna move on because we've been here for yeah. years. Thank you so much. For we want to be respectful of your time. There, we have a bunch of questions, and we may possibly do this again. Right. We really would. Are. We be able to just really quick with taxes, like address the elephant in the room of our president who hasn't paid taxes for ten of the last 17, 18 years, and while we are paying our taxes, he literally paid. A hundred, uh, five hundred, seven hundred and fifty dollars, the day, the year before he entered uh, the White House, and the first year of the White House. Lay, you're going to get everybody's going to get a chance to uh, okay. close. Yeah, we'll give everybody that opportunity. Thank you. All right, so we've already kind of talked through the economy, um, so I'm not going to list ask that question. Um, I am going to go to uh, healthcare. Um, Donald Trump vowed to immediately repeal and replace Obamacare. The individual mandate is gone, but for the most part, the Affordable Care Act is still in place. Many people uh, do not know what Trump's proposed option to the ACA is. Vice President Biden's health care plan says that he wants to ensure health care is a right for all and not a privilege for just a few. The question, the final question of the day is, why is your candidate's health care plan the right one for Americans today? We'll start with Lay, then we'll go to Sid, um, and then we'll go to Dela, and then we'll end with Rudy. Thank you. So with the Affordable Care Act, AKA Obamacare, he even said himself, this is a foundation this is a place for which we are to start and grow upon and keep um, you know, adjusting and fixing and tweaking as we expand it and grow on it. The fact that um, the Republicans want to just rip it out it makes absolutely no sense. That would leave 20 million, 30 million people um, without healthcare during a pandemic. Does that make any sense? And it's literally three or four days after the election is um, decided that the Supreme Court is going to um, make a decision on this, like to throw it out or not. And it, he says he has a plan. We've not seen it. I mean, the only plan I saw was when he put Ryan on it and it was like one page and we've seen nothing since. So, you know, there are not, that it could cause 90 million people who are not insured or barely insured up in the air. And 
you know, his executive order on um, his executive order on pre-existing conditions is literally crap. So I don't understand why they would rip it, rip it out in the middle of a pandemic and not have a plan in place. It makes zero sense. Take Obamacare, build upon it, adjust it, correct it, and every American should have access to health care. We're the one of the only, the richest country in the world, and we do not have um, the basic fundamentals of health care for all. And call that socialist, but your kids go to school, don't they? That's not a socialist program. Your parents are on social security. That's not a socialist program. Too many terms thrown out, not understanding the meaning behind them. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Lee. Um, uh, thank you, Lee. In regards to uh, the healthcare, um, there was a lot of things that was just shared in regards to uh, the Obamacare. Um, some of the issues in regards to uh, those who are uh, forced to take Obamacare, um, the one thing that uh, I, I recall very clearly that uh, President Obama was saying was that uh, you can uh, change uh, this Obamacare and you can keep your doctor. And so that issue was absolutely not true. Many people was not able to uh, keep their doctors because their doctors uh, basically had to close shop because the Obamacare affordability was basically taxing them to where they were going out of business. And if we're talking what I just heard the words socialism, that's exactly what it kind of mandates too for all these doctors, nurses uh, to basically provide this type of service without uh, having uh, a rate that they were charging before because they don't have a, a choice. Um, so they basically were being, and, and I agree, a lot of it was overpriced and it still is uh, in regards to uh, some of these doctors and medical facilities uh, when you actually get care. Um, I do know that there have people that have fell through the cracks, such as a single working mother uh, who was working uh, part-time and going to school and uh, many like her in that position fell through the cracks because they didn't make enough they didn't work uh, enough hours to be able to get uh, the health care uh, and being protected by Obamacare so as a whole I do believe that President Trump is actually taking this and uh, rectifying it and uh, using what works and and not and disregarding that stuff that doesn't thank you Thank you. Thank you, Sid. Dayla? Thank you. So I'm a little confused about physicians and facilities closing as a result of the Affordable Care Act. I, I don't really follow what that is, but since this is my industry and this is what I do, I am heartened by the fact that Affordable Care Act came into place to support those who needed access to health care with premium tax credits and things of that nature. Now, I do get the frustration that was held by citizens that it was mandated that you had to carry. So I think that's one part that I'm not so concerned that Trump removed. What I do not care for is that he is in a space where he would allow for states to roll back the 10 essential categories for health benefit coverage doctor visits, inpatient and outpatient services, pharmacy drug coverage, pregnancy and childbirth, mental health services, and dental benefits for children. That is not exciting to me that that could be rolled back because it wouldn't be supportive to go ahead um, and, and maintain those as essential services that everybody should have access to. We as Pacific Islanders are starting to come to terms with the fact that yes, we can benefit from behavioral health services, from mental health care, I don't want anybody to be in a situation with the rise of national suicide rates to not have access to take care of what they need to. Catastrophic coverage was also put in place for behavioral health conditions, prosthetic devices, diabetes, mastectomies, dietary nutritional products for inborn metabolic errors, and 
autism spectrum, spectrum disorder. And in Utah, we have many Pacific Islander children with ASD or on that spectrum. Without AS ACA, it would not be affordable. It would not be accessible. With Biden, I appreciate that Lay said that they would expand those protections to make sure that it could go ahead and still be a place and as affordable as it can be. Whenever we talk about Affordable Care Act, you know, we know that that just depends on the person and the income that you can bring. But uh, his proposal is capping health insurance premiums at 8.5% of a family's income with families making less than 400%. So Affordable Care Act, access to affordable care and quality care is extremely important for all of our citizens. Uh, I think that's my time. Thank you. Thank you, Dela. I guess it's me. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I will just say Dela will probably being in the healthcare industry, she'd school all of us all day long. So Dela, thank you. Um, <laughs> So I, I, and I'm going to speak on this as a private citizen. I mean, it's, it's, you know, something to point out is Obamacare was years in the making when first lady Hillary Clinton first touched upon this in the nineties, it had been an ongoing process. And, you know, it's, it's to come up with a plan that big in, some, in an industry that's, that's complex uh, takes a lot of time. So there was a lot of hard work and efforts on the Democrat side to put this together, to finally make it, uh, make it law. Um, during a, a, the last administration. But, you know, part of the promise when that was implemented was that people would keep their doctors and, and premiums wouldn't increase. Well, we know that once that was passed for many Americans, they weren't able to keep their doctors and many, many premiums were actually increased. Um, but the couple of things I'm excited about with the current president was, you know, he pushed an executive order for right to try where it allowed individuals that were suffering and they're going through great suffering, had the opportunity to try experimental treatments. What I also like about this administration was he has a focus on lowering prescription drugs. Um, you know, making uh, generic drugs more accessible to folks and allowing states to purchase their prescription drugs uh, outside of our country. And I think that through these various executive orders, it's very helpful and it shows a commitment to lowering costs for families and individuals in addressing their health care issues. Now, the question is, you know, what are we doing about uh, an alternative plan? You know, again, it's the Affordable Care Act required you know, decades to pull that together. It's going to require not just the White House and the president, but it's going to also require the Senate and the members of Congress to come together to put something together. So I think moving forward, I like to see what has, has, has occurred with respect to executive orders, because it shows through action the intent of what the president wants to do in terms of lowering uh, health care costs to, to those throughout the United States and, uh, and increasing accessibility. So thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Okay, we are going to, we are at the two hour mark. So yeah. um, we want to thank our panelists for their time, uh, especially because we said an hour and now we've taken two hours. I know, I know. Um, we can't say thank you enough for that. We are going to allow each of the uh, panelists to make a uh, brief statement, a closing summary. Um, again, that's two minutes, um, and then we'll say a few words, and then we'll get out of here and let everybody go about their Saturday. So uh, let's start in the same order that we just went through this last question. That was me. Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you, Carl. Thank you, Naki, for this platform for um, us to come together, um, our brothers, and sister uh, to share from our heart um, how, how we're feeling as Pacific Islanders in and amongst and in, in the midst of all around us. And I wanna thank you for um, allowing us to come and, and share our thoughts. And, you know, I really respect um, Sid and Rudy, uh, your perspectives. And, you know, the main thing I wanted to say is that we have more in common than we do not. There's a lot of things we can iron out. There's a lot of things that we can work together to come to a consensus and be inclusive. And I know that Biden is the person for that. He's always been about 
inclusivity. He's always, he's well known for crossing over the aisles. And so I know that he will surround himself with subject matter experts, scientists, reports, and those who are to counsel him. And he'll come with all of their perspectives and come with their answers instead of um, what I've heard over and over and over. I alone can do this. Nobody knows this better than me. Only I know this. No one knows this, that, that, like, like every topic the current president is supposedly the expert in. And look where we're at. We're in the craziest pandemic ever. Our children are distance learning, losing out on er so much. My business has been um, affected severely during this pandemic. And now our president is in the hospital because of what he considered to be a hoax. So I know that Biden will be inclusive. He'll pick the right people, put them in the right place, and he'll listen to everyone because he will be the president for all of America, not just the Republicans. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Larry. Well, again, I'd just like to, uh, to thank uh, Polynesian by Design, uh, Carl, Necky, much appreciation for, uh, for being able to, to have this put together. Uh, Maury, thank you so much for your thoughts to be able to bring this to fruition. Um, and uh, especially just want to thank the panel, um, Robin and uh, Daila, and, and thank you so much in regards to, um, I, I agree, I thank you so much for be able to share your perspective because we do have more in common uh, than not. Um, now, I just want to just close and, and just say that I do, as a person that believes in God and family um, and my culture and in this country, that I, I believe that uh, the necessity of having the freedom to choose is part of God's plan. Um, meaning that when others force you to not do things or to force you to say things that you don't want to say or have some, um, you know, way or demeanor or condescension on telling you that, hey, this is absolutely wrong. The way that you think in supporting this person is, is absolutely nonsense and I don't support that. Uh, having said that, um, I, I think that we can all have a wonderful debate, uh, be able to think of uh, sides and issues that we've never thought of before, and which I will absolutely tell you, I, I'm taking away some things that are actually of good thoughts um, from, again, things that I may not have thought of uh, before. But uh, in, in closing, again, that uh, President Trump is who I support. Um, you may look at the things that he says, but I look at the things that he does and the policies that he puts in place protects all Americans. And so I just want us to say that, uh, yes, he's, he may have, and so is the first lady may have COVID, but you know what? Uh, he never said that it wasn't real in, in regards to that. It was the hoax as it being killing everybody that gets it. So having said that, I stand with the president of, uh, United States. Uh, Trump and Pence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank sir. you, Sid. As I close out my comments, I want to thank Vice President um, Biden and his team for actually taking down any sort of attack ads while President Biden is going, or excuse me, President. See, I'm already there. He's our next president. Um, <laughs> Hello, 46. That's it. <laughs> um, so let me let me come let me walk that back. So I do appreciate that took down the ads. Could go ahead and put politics a bit to the side to make sure that he could look out for the health and wellness of a human, of a person. And that is not what I feel. That's not what I see. That is not what I experience um, from 45. Uh, so with that, I'm putting my vote behind dignified leadership. I'm putting my vote behind experts. I'm putting my vote behind science. We are from islands that are going through climate change and climate justice. If we can't figure out a way to look out for ourselves and our people who are not here in America, what does that say about us? 
I think about God in action and a God in action or whatever that higher power is looking out for everybody. And what I see is so much segmentation. And so I am looking out to make sure that my vote is not supporting campaign financing with special interests. I want to make sure that my vote is protecting voting rights and ends gerrymandering and fair maps. I am putting my vote behind people who respect checks and balances and can work across the aisle. Uh, Biden has proven that, as has Senator Harris. I would like to see us come back to a moral compass that works for the greater, greater whole versus those who are lining their pockets. I would like to see that the economy can be can be boosted and fair for everybody. And I am looking out for just those equal opportunities, equal rights, equal justice for our brown, black, all colors of the spectrum that make up this beautiful nation of immigrants. And lastly, I just want the economy to show that it can reward the people who are doing the work to make this country so wonderful and that we can protect our military, protect those that we serve and protect everybody who makes up this great nation. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Dana. Thanks. Uh, I just wanna take the opportunity again, like everyone else, thank you to Naki and Carl and everyone behind the scenes with Poly by Design. Uh, this definitely was not an easy effort, I'm sure to put together uh, during these times, right? And, uh, you know, kudos to all of you for creating a platform where all the folks in our community can get together and listen to good dialogue between sane panelists as opposed to extremists and pundits that we're all getting tired of seeing on all the different news channels and on social media. So thank you to all of you and all of my fellow panelists. Um, you know, from, from my perspective, I believe the contrast is pretty clear between the two nominees. Um, you know, President, President Trump has proven that moving forward post pandemic, we're gonna need a president that's really gonna prioritize and focus on getting the economy going, focus on bringing back law and order and supporting educational choice for parents and families. And while Biden throughout this campaign has talked about bringing about change, um, you know, that's something that he's been talking about for 47 years as a DC insider. Uh, while he's talking about change for the past 47 years, our president, President Trump, has delivered in 47 months. So as folks do their research and they look at all the issues, I ask that everyone look beyond the noise, beyond the extremist rhetoric on both sides, and look at the real issues. Ultimately, families want to make sure we've got a strong economy. We want to make sure that from a law and order standpoint, we're safe. And of course, we want our families to have access to the best education out there. So I hope you're looking at all those issues and you'll see that the, the, there is a contrast. And regardless of what your decision is after election day, I hope that all animosity and all the demonization is thrown out the window because there's a lot of work that we have to do together. And so I look forward to, regardless of who our next president is, uh, I'm looking forward to getting back to the days where we can go back to each other's backyards and have barbecues and laugh and joke around uh, because you know the Islanders are an underserved community and uh, we've got to remember that regardless of who's in, we've got to remind people of who we are. So thank you to all, and especially for the, for the two awesome women from the Biden-Harris folks. Um, I will tell you that it's very rare that we get an opportunity as activists to, to be on the same platform where we could actually share ideas. And I think it's important to hear contrasting ideas because sometimes we get tunnel vision in our own ideas. And sometimes it's important to be reminded on the other side because we can't come up with solutions and work together unless we're also listening. So thank you to all and look, look, look forward to the next time. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, Rudy. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Sid. Crazy. Thank, thank you, you Polly, by design. Thank, thank you, you everybody. All. Thanks, thank panelists. You guys. Thanks, thank you. production team. Yes. Yes, production team. Carl? This is awesome. Um, all right. So. We have probably, I don't know, three or four, maybe five more topics that we didn't get get a chance to get to. So we may end up doing this again. Um, and that's if the if the panelists um, would want to finish off the other topics. So um, I definitely want to thank um, the panelists for their time. Um, I want to thank Maury and Talavo Almavai, uh, Kevin Donovan and Nicole Johnson for all the support behind the scenes. Uh, Naki for participating because I had to drag her kicking and screaming into being the moderator. <laughs> and I will say this, look, we, we got to live with each other. And this was a point made by every one of the panelists here today. We got to live with each other. We're a community. 
Um, I'll go back to a contested election in 2000. I mean, that went to the Supreme Court and they were counting hanging chads and, and recounting ballot boxes and doing all kinds of crazy things. What's Al Gore doing for us today? What's George Bush doing for us today? Not much. They're not even in our lives, but we're in our lives still from 2000. So to see people getting divided and disowning family and loved ones and friends over politics, I just look at it and I say, look at the people that we have here. We've got two passionate Trump supporters. We've got two passionate Biden supporters. We're having a civil conversation. There's respect. And you can tell at the end of all this, no matter who's in that White House, who's at Pennsylvania Avenue after the election, we're all still community. We're all still family. We're all still loved ones. So if you're out there, stop disowning your family over politics. Stop bringing up friendships and lifelong relationships over politics. And I put it this way. I'm a man of God. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a brother. I'm a cousin. Way down after that, I care about politics. So I'm not going to blow up any of the other relationships above politics because those are of a higher priority for me. Those are me. Those are my, That's my life. And that's what makes me who I am. So take an advantage of take advantage of what you see here today. Look what happened on Tuesday and then look what a debate this is. This is what a debate should look like. It should be an even exchange of information and not acting the way that that we saw happen on Tuesday. I hope President Trump um, and First Lady Melania and all people with COVID-19 recover fully. We thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for watching if you're if you're online. And I hope to do this again. Thank you all. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.